Welcome to this week's Harness Racing Alumni Show, brought to you by Hunterton Farms, Colwell Bankers Joe Rico, and Crawford Farms. I'm Freddie Hudson, and I'm here today with Trade Martin and Bob Marks. The Harness Racing Alumni Show is the number one harness racing podcast in North America. We have sponsorships and advertising spots available. For more information, email rrtrotten at outlook.com or visit ustrots.com. The Harness Racing Alumni Show with your host, Freddie Hudson and Trey Martin. Hunterton Farm, the birthplace of champions, will be selling their 2023 consignment at the Lexington Selected Sale, October 2nd through the 6th, and the Harrisburg Sale, November 6th through the 10th. For more information, call 859-987-3983 or email huntertonfarm at cs.com. You can also visit their website at huntertonfarm.com. Hunterton Farm, breeding champions year after year. On this week's broadcast, we're going to share with you the story of how Yonkers Raceway came to being. While the name William Clark may not mean much to anyone nowadays, but William Clark, he was a board member of the 500 member plus driving club of New York. Uh, other members included William Vanderbilt, um, William Rockefeller, Oliver Belmont. And in 1887, the club's trotting track, Fleetwood Park, which was in the Bronx, was sold by its owners, and the driving club of New York found itself without a track to conduct its races. This caused the club's members to decline, and membership's dues were not being paid. So the club officers and members went in search of a suitable replacement for their track. Two properties were located, uh, but the members were in disagreement of location, and some members were seeking to build a half-mile track, while many others wanted the location in Manhattan and a mile track, believe it or not. Uh, so then enters um, William Clark. Um, he had been the uh, New York City corporate attorney under uh, two different mayors, uh, Mayor Thomas Gilroy and Hugh Grant. And he was the leading uh, board member of the Tammany Hall, and that, which was at that time under the leadership of uh, which was Richard Croker. Uh, he was also a prominent thoroughbred owner, owning some of the so, owning some of the best thoroughbreds in the country. Uh, he had made his fortune in real estate and and then the Wall Street stock market. In 1898, at the age of 43, he was considered a self-made millionaire, and that's back you know 19, 1898. Also a member of the driving club of New York was James Butler, an Irish immigrant who had made his fortune in the ownership of grocery stores. In 1900, his Butler grocery stores had over 1,100 stores nationwide, and that ranked him as the second largest grocery retailer in the U.S., only behind the A&P stores. Uh, both men uh, set out looking for suitable properties. Butler represented the driving club, and Clark on his own. Um, Butler found two properties that were put on the uh, list of consideration uh, for the driving club board, driving club's board. Uh, Clark, on the other hand, went out and purchased 100 acres for the sum of 150000 The land was located between Yonkers, uh, Mount Vernon, and White Plains on what then was part of the Peace and Potter Estates. While the driving club was uh, only looking to build a half-mile track, uh, Clark's plans were to build a mile track and to have both thoroughbreds and trotters racing at the new track. The plan called for the building of a grandstand, a mile over track, and a stable area, all to be constructed within a six-month time frame. As Clark started his uh, venture, his luck was about to change. Clark had always been lucky and received a lot of uh, inside information from his associates at Tammany Hall. In 1897, 1897 uh, Clark fell out of favor with the Tammany Hall members, especially the leader, Richard Croker. Um, in the Belmont, in which his horse was the favorite, his horse never got out of the gate. He, I mean, he just stood there. Uh, his jockey ended up suspending his jockey who was on the contract. The jockey couldn't get any more mounts. But um, in his real estate transactions, uh, they, were, they were now costing him money, and his stocks were fail, failing in value. Um, the cost of building his racetrack was uh, far exceeding the projections. Um, Clark had applied for um, grand circuit dates and had received them. Um, he had also applied with the jockey club to conduct a thoroughbred meet and re receiving the runaround and had even scheduled a meeting in which their representatives didn't show up. They eventually uh, denied his request. 
Uh, the final cost of building Yonkers was 850000 and Clark didn't have the money. With the track near completion and the Grand Circuit six-day meet scheduled to start in early September, uh, Clark went up to Saratoga with the remaining money, and um, he gambled it on the roulette and barrel tables. Uh, in one night, he lost 40000 and for the week, he lost over 100000 uh, The Grand Circuit meet started on schedule in September of 1899, and it was considered a successful meet with over 40,000 spectators showing up, and it only raced for five days. The sixth day was canceled because of the, uh, dry, dry, the horseman refusing to enter the box because it was going to be single heat racing. Um, the other thing he uh, introduced, is he changed the five heats, and they went the best of three heats. But um, then with his finances in ruins, uh, Clark went into hiding. Creditors were looking for him. Uh, they were all looking to be paid. Uh, Grand Circuit horse owners were looking for their purse monies. Uh, he never sent out any purse money. Well, on February 16, 1900, a news article was released that stated that Clark was in mental disorder and was financially ruined. Now, the next day, his brother stated to the New York Times that there was no truth to either story and that his brother was recovered from bronchitis and was under his doctor's care. The next day, um, on February 17, 1900, it was reported that William H. Clark had died that morning of congested lungs. Many at that time did not re believe that report, and they felt that he had committed suicide. Upon his death, it would later be known that Clark was close to half a million in debt. Um, the Jockey Club, in order to help raise money for Clark's widow, granted a two-week race meet to the Empire Racetrack for a 1900 fall meet. Also, the track was awarded grand circuit dates for the fall of 1900, with a guarantee of purse monies um, being available both. That he had the guarantee that the purse money was going to be available because they didn't pay the purse money the last meet. Um, both meets went off and were very successful. In early 1901, the track was put up on auction so as to pay off Clark's debts. The winning bidder was a guy named Frank Farrell, who at the time was known as the uh, Pujol King. Uh, he was New York City's most successful bookie. He owned the Manhattan Casino, and he also owned several thoroughbreds. His winning bid for Empire City Racetrack was 218000 which was a pretty good bargain for a track that cost 850000 to build. The estate immediately challenged the bid, stating that they had someone that was willing to pay more, more than the 218000 The judge gave them two weeks to produce a bidder. The Driving Club of New York offered 300000 for the Empire City Racetrack, and the judge and the estate accepted the bid. Frank Farrell, on the other hand, with, his, with prohibition now being enforced in New York, he was forced out of the bookmaking and casino business. In 1903, uh, he took the money that he would have used to buy the Empire City Racetrack, and he bought a baseball team from Baltimore called the Baltimore Orioles. He then moved the team to New York and changed the team's name to the New York Highlanders. Then in 1910, the Highlanders would change their name to the New York Yankees. In 1905, James Butler would purchase Empire City Racetrack from the Driving Club of New York. Also, at that time, he would have a falling out with the harness racing Grand Circuit over the fact that his trainer didn't make the stake payments as he was supposed to, and the Grand Circuit wanted him to return all of the purse money that he had been awarded. He would then sell off all of his driving horses and totally went in concentration with thoroughbreds. Empire City, under Butler's ownership, would become an official thoroughbred racetrack, and the driving club of New York would continue to have meets at Empire City Racetrack until 1915. The track would host thoroughbreds until 1941, and then due to war and the tax demand by the city of Yonkers, it would switch its meets over to the Jamaican uh, Long Island track, harness light racing for a short meet in 1943, and Yonkers would become a full-time harness track in 1950. If you're buying or selling your home, Joe Rico is your go-to guy. Joe has been representing buyers and sellers on Long Island for 30 years. He is an expert in all types of sales. Don't sell for average. Call or text Joe Rico today at 516-524-4870. That's Joe Rico at 516-524-4870. You know what, Freddie? Give everybody Joe's email address. 
That's Joe Rico, C21 at yahoo.com. The Standard Bread Retirement Foundation has been rescuing and caring for Standard Breads since 1989. They now have over 470 horses in their care. Find out how you can help. Visit adoptahorse.org, the Standard Bread Retirement Foundation. Okay, we hope that you enjoyed today's history lesson about Yonkers Raceway. Thanks for listening, and thank you to our sponsors, Huntington Farms, Colwell Bankers, Joe Rico, and Crawford Farms. The Harness Racing Alumni Show podcast is the number one harness racing podcast in North America and is listened to worldwide on multiple platforms, including Spreaker, Google Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. This is Freddie Hudson, along with Trade Martin and Bob Marks. Thanks for listening, and please join us again next week. The Harness Racing Alumni Show. 